Hello everyone, it's Wilson here. Today I want to talk about how to graph this polynomial function. And as you can see, this is a third degree polynomial and I also uh, include the factor form so that it's easier for us to move on with the calculation. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, first we are going to find the domain, right? Because right now what we are doing is that we are going to find a list of things following the guideline in uh, in a typical calculus textbooks like that of the uh, the James Stewart calculus textbook where we find all those things like the intervals of increase and decrease, local max, local mean, inflection points, asymptotes. And so we use all those information to help us graph the function. Okay, so first thing, again, um, we are going to find the domain, right? So because this is a polynomial function, we know that the domain is going to be all real numbers. So if we put it in the interval notation, then it will be from negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so that's that part is done. And then the next step is to find the first and the second derivatives, because we're going to need them for the critical numbers and then also the potential inflection points. Right, so we have the uh, first and second derivatives. And then so this step is actually an easy step. Uh, it can be more difficult if we have a more difficult function, but then since this is a polynomial, then it will be easy. So um, what is the first derivative? f prime is equal to. So um, if we are taking the derivative, and it would be a good idea to use the, the, the form that's not factor, right? So if you're using the factor form, what happens is that you, you need to use the the power rule and then also the product rule. But then right here, then you can only... Um, you only need to differentiate term by term. So you are going to get 3x squared minus 12x and then plus 9. Okay, so that's our first derivative. And then we have the second derivative here. Then you are going to be getting what? Take the derivative of the first derivative. Then you are going to get 6x minus 12. Okay, so that's all that, right? And then now we can continue to... To do the next one, uh, next one would be critical numbers. Right? So that's actually quite important because we're going to use that. And then also we want to find the potential inflection points because that's also needed for, um, for identifying the actual inflection points. And so how do we find the critical numbers? To find the critical numbers, we are going to just use the definition of critical numbers, of course, right? So one case is that when f prime is equal to zero, then what kind of values that you plug into the to the f prime function, then you will get zero. So all we need to do is to set f prime equal to zero. Okay, so what do we get here? We get 3x squared minus 12x plus 9 is equal to zero. Okay, so that's what we do, right? And when we um, when we run into a quadratic equation like this, either we can factor it or we can use a quadratic formula if it's not factorable over the set of integers. So um, it turns out that this is factorable. And so what we can do is that we can just try to factor this. We can factor the three, right, from every term. So we get three times uh, x squared minus, what is that? That's going to be 4x and then plus 3 equals 0. Now, if we look at this x squared minus 4x plus 3, we can actually factor it into a product of two linear factors. So we get x uh, minus 3 and then x minus 1 equals 0. Yeah, how do we get that? Well, we can see that x times x is x squared. The minus 3 times the minus 1 gives you the positive 3. See that the, the positive sign for the constant term here tells us that we have to have the same sign right here, right? And then so to get the negative 4, we do want both signs to be negative so that we can get the negative 4. If this is positive 4, then we want both signs to be positive. Right. So right now we are ready to find the critical numbers. We have two critical numbers right here, as you can see. So one of them is x equals three. The other one is x equals one. So we have two critical numbers, x equals three, x equals one. Okay, so that's 
That's one subcase right here. Um, according to the definition, according to the definition of critical numbers, we also want to find where f prime the number at where the function f prime function is undefined, right? So can this be undefined? Actually not because this is a polynomial. So it's going to be what is defined at for all x, right? So there is no value that will cause this f prime to be undefined. So right now, what do we have here? We will simply just say that no x value, then it will be okay. Yeah, so we only have <clears throat> we only have uh, two critical numbers, okay? And then now the next step is to find the potential inflection point. So we actually need to just do that quickly right here. So potential inflection point. Okay. Yeah, so how do we find this one? Um, all we need to do, right, is to set... <clears throat> this 6x minus 12 equal to zero. Okay, so we can do 6x minus 12. Actually, we can do, yeah, so we set f prime, f double prime equal to zero. So you get 6x minus 12 is equal to zero. So in this case, you get x to be two, right? So you got x to be two. Okay, there is also a y value that we need to identify here, but we'll just wait until later to to determine the y value um, if it's an inflection point. If it's the x value of any actual inflection point, then we are going to find the y value later on. But right now, we the x value is okay, okay? And then um, the other case, again, just like when we're finding the critical numbers, this x, x, 6x minus 12 is actually uh, <clears throat> it's a linear... Uh, expression, or you can actually think of that as a polynomial. So it's, again, it's going to be defined for all x. So we don't need to worry about the other case. So um, a, an inflection point can show up at x equals 2. Okay, so that's, that's the idea there. So right now, the next step, the next step is to... <clears throat> To do this we are going to do what we are going to find the concavity and then also the intervals of increase and decrease so let's do that here so the next step the next step is that we are going to do part what is that the part d okay so we want to find the intervals of increase and decrease okay and then concavity Okay, so now let's let's do one at a time. So we are going to first find the intervals of increase and decrease. So we have increase and then decrease right here. So what we want to do is that we are going to construct a sign analysis chart on f prime. Okay, so that's on the first derivative, right? Because um, <clears throat> we know that if f prime is positive on an interval, then f is increasing on that interval. If f prime is negative on uh, interval, then f is going to be, well, decreasing on that interval, right? So what we're going to do right now is that we are going to just draw the lumber line, right? So let's do that. So this is actually our x-axis right here. And then what happened is that we are going to just plot the two critical numbers on this lumber line. So we have three and then we also have one. So we are going to put that in here. And so we are going to get those two. Okay, so now what do we do? We are going to pick a number in each interval and then plug it back into the first derivative so that we can see whether f prime is positive or negative. We actually don't care about the actual value. We only care about the sign, right? So what we can do is that we are going to pick a number that's between one and three. So we can pick two. Okay, so we can pick two here. 
and then plug it back into the derivative function. In this case, I would say that it's easier if you plug it back into the factor form. And you know that we had this as the first derivative and then we change its form into this one, right? So we can simply just use that one. So the three does not really matter because it's a positive number here. So all we need to do is to plug in two into this X here and then also this X and we want to check whether F prime is positive or negative, right? So put the two in here, then you are going to get a negative number, right? Because two minus three is negative. And then two minus one is positive, so you get positive here. And so when you take a negative number times a positive number, and of course there was the three, but that's also a positive number, and we have an odd number of negative sign, so this product would be a negative number. So that means f is decreasing on the interval from 1 to 3, right? So let's continue. So let's do this. So we are going to get, um, let's pick big number here, 1,000, right? So that will actually make things easy. So we pick 1,000. We can do 3 times 1,000 minus 3, that's positive. 1,000 minus 1, also positive. So everything is positive here, right? You see that 1,000, even though it feels like a big number will make the calculation more difficult, but that's not really true, right? So you can see that that's quite obvious that the sign is positive. Okay, so the next one, the next one is that we got to pick something less than one. So the easy number that we can pick would be zero. Okay, so if you put in the zero and when you put in the zero, it's actually a good idea to put it in the expanded form or the unfactor form because you put the zero in here, you get just get nine, right? So that's positive. So I don't even need to um, check the product. I can simply say that that's positive, right? So we are good, right? So we can actually write down the results right here. Uh, so the function is increasing on the interval from, uh, let me see, so negative infinity to a positive one, and then from three to positive infinity. As you can see, that's one, that's the other one, right? <clears throat> now, um, when is it decreasing? It's decreasing from one to three. As you can see, this has a minus sign there, so you get one and three. Okay, is that good? So we got the intervals of increase and decrease. And then the next step is to uh, determine the intervals of concavity, right? So let's do that here. So we are going to be getting the sign analysis chart on F double prime. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this time we are going to use the second derivative. And then again, let's just make the lumber line first, right? So we can make a lumber line right here. And then that's actually our x-axis. Right? So you put only the potential point here. Well, actually, that's the x value, the, the potential inflection point here. So we get the 2. Did I say the potential point? I actually meant potential inflection point. Okay, let's continue. Yeah, so we only have two intervals that we need to test. Right. So we can do, um, let's check. So we can put in... Um, Again, we can put in 1,000 right here, right? So if you put in 1,000 here, 6,000 minus 12, that's obvious. It's positive, right? So you get positive here. And then on the left side of the two, we can plug in a zero, right? So you pick zero. And then zero minus 12, that's negative, right? So get a negative number here. Okay. So we actually good, right? We can actually start writing down the uh, intervals of concavity. So the function is concave up from two to infinity, as you can see from the interval here, two to infinity. And then the function is going to be concave down, right? From negative infinity to two. So we got those intervals already.
Now um, we can still find other information. There are some important information that we want to find here, which are the local max, local mean, and the actual inflection points. Is that okay? So to find the local max and local mean, we can use the first derivative test because the chart is already constructed here. So that will actually make things easy. So what happened is that you can see that the function is increasing before one, and then after one, it turns to decreasing. So you can see that it's increasing and then decreasing. And then for here, then before three, it's decreasing. And then after three, then it's increasing, right? So you have the curve that looks like this right here. So do you see what's going on here? We have uh, a local max at x equals one and a local min at x equals three by just looking at the shape of the graph. Okay, so let's write them down. So we have, what is that? That's the part did E, right? We did E. No, that's actually part D. So we are going to do part um, E here. So hey, we want to find the local maximum, minimum, and the inflection points, right? or the point inflections. Okay, so let's let's do this. First one, local max, right? So how do you find the local maximum point? Um, <clears throat> so let's look at the chart here. So you can see that that's, uh, that's when x equals one, we have a local max. So that means we are going to have f of one, right? And then I would say that it would be a good idea to plug the one not into the um, <clears throat> to unfactor form. We put it in the factor form. It will make the calculation easier, right? So we can do one minus four and then one minus one square. And you can see that we don't need to do too much calculation because one minus one is zero. So zero square and then times anything, it's all zero. So you just get zero here. And so what happened is that the point that we want is just going to be one zero. Okay, next, local minimum. So now for the local minimum, we have um, we have that at the three, right? So let's take a look. We have the local minimum at x equals three. So we plug this back into the original function, right? Again, in the factor form, it will be easier. So we have three minus four. And then three minus one square. Okay. So now three minus four is negative one. And then three minus one is two squares, four, right? Four times negative one is negative four. So we have a point three and then negative four here. How do we get the points? Remember, the number that you plug in is the x value and then the value that you computed is the y value, right? So three and negative four. So you put that in the order pair form. So right now, also the inflection point, right? So the, there was a potential inflection point. And now how do you tell that that's actually an inflection point? Well, you can see that there was a change of concavity, right? There was a change of concavity um, through this x value, right? So before two, f is concave down, and then after two, f is concave up, right? So as you can see, so there was a change of concavity, and this number is also in the domain. So that will be an actual inflection point. So you can put the two, again, put it back into the function, right? The original function. So this is f, right? So don't plug it back into f prime or f double prime, just f. And then so we are going to find the y value, which is 2 minus 4, and then 2 minus 1 square. So now 2 minus 1 is 1, right? Square is still 1, so you just get like the 2. So we get like the 2 here. So what do we get here? 2, like the 2. Okay. Um. <clears throat> A few more things that we can do right here. One is that we can do 
we can try to find the end behaviors, right? Then you may say, what about the asymptotes? Um, there are no asymptotes because the function is a polynomial, right? So we can say there are no, right? There is none, right? But we can still find the end behaviors right here. What can we do? We can take the limit. So we are going to take the limit as x approaching infinity of the function. And then you may say, which forms that we use? Um, if you're um, taking the limit, it's actually up to you. It doesn't really matter which form. But we still say that the factor form uh, can actually be quite easy. So it would be x minus 4 and then x minus 1 square. Now, guess what? Um, x is getting larger and larger, right? Because x is approaching infinity. So this would also be approaching infinity. x minus 4 is approaching infinity when x is approaching infinity. And then x minus 1, also approaching infinity, and you square it, still approaching infinity. So then the whole product is approaching infinity. So you get, you get infinity right here. And then you let x approach negative infinity. And then if you look at the far left, let's see what we will get here. Now, when x is approaching negative infinity, then x minus 4 will be approaching negative infinity. But this would be approaching positive infinity because of the square. So this product would actually be approaching negative infinity. OK? <clears throat> OK, now lastly, there is one more thing that we can find here, which is the intercepts, right? Okay, so you may say, how do we find the x-intercept? Well, the x-intercept, how do you find the x-intercept? You set y equal to 0, right? And we already have the factor form, so that makes finding the x-intercepts really easy. So you are just going to get 0 is equal to x minus 4, and then times x minus 1 squared. So you get x equals 4 and then x or x equals 1, right, in this equation. So that means the points for the x-intercepts would be 4, 0, 1, 0. Then you may say, what about the y-intercept? y-intercept is when you plug 0 into the original function. I mean, when you plug 0 into the x, right? So in this case, you can use the unfactor form, the unfactor form, right? So you get 0 for all those terms, and then you just get negative 4. So we get negative 4 right here. What is the point? We get 0, negative 4. So right now, we are ready to graph. And to start graphing, uh, first, one thing that's important is that if we have asymptotes, we will graph them first. But because we have no asymptotes for this function, then we are going to start plotting the points. Okay, so the first point that we will be plotting would be the intercepts, right? And so we plot the 4, 0, which is right here. So this is 4, 0. And then the other one is 1, 0. So you get the 1, 0 right here. And then you also have the 0, negative 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So we get that point here. And I'm just going to use uh, green for the y-intercept, so 0, negative 4. So it will be that point. OK? And then now um, the other points. The local max and local min, so we have local max and local min. OK, local max is 1, 0. Turns out that it's actually the same point right here. And then the other point is 3, negative 4. So 1, 2, and 3. And then negative 4, which is right here. OK. Now, what about the inflection point, the 2, negative 2? So we get 2 and then negative 2, which is right here. So we get that inflection point. 
And then also we can look at the end behaviors. How do we indicate the end behaviors? When you go to the far right, what happens to the function? It will shoot up to infinity. So that means you can, when you go to the far right, right? Positive infinity. When X is approaching infinity, then you're going to get this. I'm just putting an arrow here. I will adjust the graph later. Now, what about the um, when X is approaching negative infinity? The function will also be approaching negative infinity. So I'm put the arrow down here. Right. And so we're actually ready to do the graphing. And then when we do the graphing, it would be a good idea to just pay attention to the intervals of increase and decrease and also the concavity. Right. So from <clears throat> so from um, one to three, the function is decreasing. OK, so decreasing, that means we got to go down, but we also need to pay attention to the concavity. So do you see that it's from one to two, then the function is concave down and it's decreasing. So we're going to go down. And then as you can see, it's going to look like this. OK, so that's con that that's having a shape of concave down. And then now after the two, it becomes concave up. And then you know that this is a change of concavity, so it will become concave up, right? So concave up. Okay. Yeah, this one is slightly off, so let me redraw it. Okay. I don't know why it looks still slightly off here. Right? Yeah. Okay. I think that looks better. Now, what happens is that we know that this is the local minimum, right? And so in this case, the graph would start increasing again after the three. So it will just go up like that. And then we'll just keep going up. And then we can erase the arrow up here, right? So we'll make it nicer. It's concave up, right? And then now this is a local max. So that means uh, before this point, the function is like increasing. And then also it's concave down, right? So you can do this. And then the function needs to go to the y intercept, right? So you get, get this function to continue to go down. And then so we can erase this arrow right here. So let me just label all those things right here. This is um, x intercept, right? And then it's four zero. Okay, there's another x intercept right here. X intercept. Um, what is that? One zero, right? And then there was the Then there is the y intercept. And then there is also the local min, which is uh, local min is in this case would be three, negative four. What about the local max? The local max is also this point right here. The local max. And then the point is actually one zero, as you can see. And then also there was the inflection point, right? There was the inflection point. Yeah, this one is the IP, which is uh, two like the two. So you have all that. So how do you feel about this problem? This is all the whole process that we have for everything, right? Okay, so that's it. To help make math learning available to everyone, please share my videos to others and subscribe to my channel. It will give me support to make more videos. I want to work together with you to help students and children learn math more easily. Thank you for watching. See you next time.